All right. Well, yeah, let's do this. Hey, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for coming. Uh, despite the fact that I don't know where you are, uh, but here in DC, the weather is finally picking up. Um, so I'm Grant Whitney. I'm the treasurer of the Georgetown University Wargaming Society. Uh, we're really excited to have Dr. Peter Skoblik here. Um, before I do a, uh, his introduction, just want to do a, a couple kind of quick primers. Um, we do ask that everyone, I think everyone's a pro at this point, but everyone turns on or turns off rather their uh, video and mic just kind of reduces uh, any background noise for the presentation. Uh, and then if you have any questions, please feel free to toss them in the chat, uh, either to me privately or just in public. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Skobik at the end of the presentation, um, I'll kind of, you know, combine the questions in the best manner possible and I'll toss them your way. Um, and then just looking ahead uh, for uh, anyone else looking to get um, a little more taste of Georgetown University Wargaming. Uh, I know next week on April 6th, we've got uh, Dr. Andrew Reddy uh, coming in to discuss the use of war games for social science research. Uh, the week after that on April 13th, we've got Jacqueline Schneider, Reed Polly, and Eric Lynn Greenberg to talk about wargaming as part of IR research, international relations research. Okay, but today we are really excited to have Dr. Peter Skoblik, who's the co-founder and principal of Event Horizon Strategies, to talk about using war games to battle uncertainty. Um, Dr. Skoblik, I won't try and butcher your whole resume. Uh, it's much more impressive than I'm probably going to give it justice to, so I'll let you introduce yourself. And uh, yep, thank you everyone for coming, and uh, please go ahead. Oh, gosh. Well, introducing myself is always a, a bit of a, a danger. But first, let me just start off by thanking uh, Grant and Sebastian and everyone at the Georgetown University War Gaming Society for uh, inviting me to deliver this presentation. I confess it's a bit daunting uh, to, to deliver a presentation on war gaming to a group of war gaming experts, especially as I came to the topic, uh, not through war gaming per se, but actually through the, the study of uncertainty. Um, which I will talk about in just a moment. But by way of quick introduction, I should confess I'm a recovering journalist, uh, spent many years in magazines uh, at the New Republic and at Foreign Policy, a uh, brief stint in government at the Senate Foreign Relations Committee, and then uh, decided as one does when one turns 40 to return to graduate school and get my doctorate uh, from business school. Um, which was a, a definitely a, a career pivot, but it's one that's allowed me to explore a number of really interesting issues, um, some of which we're going to talk about tonight. Um, so with that, let me let me get started. I want to talk about using war games to battle uncertainty. And as I said, I, uh, I came to this topic not through war games per se, but through um, an original interest in uncertainty that I developed. And specifically this question that kept bothering me and, and pestering me throughout grad school. And it's a broad question for those of you who have gone to, to grad school or through a doctoral program, you know, you're not supposed to ask broad questions. You're supposed to ask very narrow, specific questions. Um, that's not what I did. Um, and as a result, I, the, the product of my doctoral work was a little bit eclectic. Um, and as you can gather from the, the subtitle of the presentation, if you saw it tweeted out or uh, at the, the uh, invite site. Um, it involves both Frank Knight, uh, an economist, um, you know, who, who published his major work in 1921, and Herman Kahn, of course, the, the sort of famous or infamous nuclear strategist. And to the best of my knowledge, these two figures have never been brought together uh, before in a paper. I may be wrong about that. I don't want to uh, oversell my own novelty, but it just sort of the breadth of this question, how do you formulate strategy under uncertainty? let me take an unusual approach to both the question of strategy and to the question of uncertainty. And the first thing I had to do was ask myself, well, what does uncertainty mean? And that's where Frank Knight comes into the picture. Um, and for those of you who don't know Frank Knight or know who he was, he was a dominating intellectual force. That's the, the first thing that you need to know. But he's this rather stern looking gentleman in, in this slide who, um, began his, his doctoral career actually as a, he wanted to get his doctorate in philosophy um, and he was going to attend Cornell. He was ruled um, by the department to be too skeptical 
to get a doctorate in philosophy. And so he decamped um, and, and, and got his degree instead in economics. And his dissertation, um, which was called Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit, which we'll talk about a bit more, um, became a, a, a book that is still in print today. So again, for those of you who have gone through a doctoral program, this is the sort of person who's setting the bar rather high. Um, and after he, it suffice it to say, my dissertation is not going to be in print a century from now. I mean, you know, 100 years literally since 1921. Um, but he publishes his dissertation. He goes to the University of Chicago, where he joins the faculty of the economics department and, and later does some work at the business school once that is founded. Um, he becomes one of the founders of the Chicago School of Economics. He mentors three Nobel laureates. He serves as the president of the American Economic Association. Um, he wins the, the Francis Walker Award, a prestigious economics award. Um, but he's this, this figure that on the one hand is, is, is this dominating inter intellectual force, but he's marked by these wild contradictions. Um, for any of you who have, who have read his work, who have sort of gone down the rabbit hole of, of Frank Knight's writings, it's, a, it's an incredible oeuvre, but it's not an easy one, um, in, in part just because of his writing style. And um, this is a man who, you know, as, as befits perhaps an academic in the interwar period, but also someone whose hobby was to translate Weber from the original German. Um, his, his prose could be a bit dense um, and, and turgid. Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit is a 350 page long book. And he also had a, a tendency to, to write sentences like this. Uh, all principles are false because all are true in a sense and to a degree. And so when you're trying to nail down uh, what the guy thought, it can occasionally be a bit of a challenge but he left this incredible mark on the field of economics. I sort of feel like he's the most, most influential economist that people tend not to have heard of. Um, but when he died, he was, he was lauded both by his, um, his mentees and, and by others. Um, George Stiegler, uh, who had been a student of his, noted that uh, Knight was not shy about his opinions. Um, he would not hesitate to tell Gabriel if his horn needed tuning is one of my favorite lines, I think, from an obituary ever. Um, and Paul Samuelson noted, you know, his, his sort of pessimistic nature saying, you know, speaking of Milton Friedman here, if Milton Friedman is one of those optimists who thinks that capitalism is the best of all possible words, worlds, Dr. Knight was one of those pessimists who's afraid that this is indeed the case. So um, a, an interesting guy, um, a, a sort of irascible figure, um, but he leaves his mark on the field of economics and, and I would say more, more broadly by um, drawing this distinction between risk and uncertainty. Um, and this is, this is a page from the original manuscript. I went to the University of Chicago a couple of years ago and rummaged through the archives, which through a, through a Frank Knight fanatic is, is you know, a, a bit of a, a mystical experience. Um, and as I mentioned, it's, it's a long book. It's a turgid book. It's a difficult book. But Knight does us the favor of condensing its chief point into this one sentence, um, which explains the difference between risk and uncertainty. And he says, the practical difference between the two categories, risk and uncertainty, is that in the former, the distribution of the outcomes in a group of instances is known, either through calculation or from statistics of past experience, while in the case of uncertainty, this is not true. And so risk is the sort of thing that you can estimate with frequentist probabilities or what, what Knight called scientific probabilities. So your sort of archetypal example might be something like life insurance actuaries deal in the business of risk because there are so many instances of past experience of you know 40 something year old men um, you know going through life that you you know when uh, someone is likely to die or not you have just a lot of data a lot of past experiences um, uncertainty by contrast is marked by this absence of past experience of an inability to analogize to anything that we've experienced in the past. And so Knight actually sees uncertainty as an extremely positive thing. It's what enables profit, it enables organizations, it's frankly what enables 
human agency. He writes that, you know, no matter how much we hate uncertainty, and of course we do, we find it like viscerally uncomfortable. Um, if we didn't, if there were no uncertainty, if that would, that would suggest that, you know, a uh, uh, philosophy of determinism uh, and that we really have no free will. So Knight was a fan of uncertainty. And the way he, you know, he characterizes it um, in, in distinguishing it from risk sort of suggests this dichotomy. And, and that's what he's known for, is this dichotomy between risk and uncertainty. Um, uncertainty, you know, or risk rather being possible futures are known and we can assign them frequentist probabilities. And this is sort of, you know, squarely where economics tends to fall. And uncertainty, possible futures are known, but we can assign them only subjective prob probabilities. We can only sort of come up with guesses as to what is most likely to happen or how likely any given thing is to happen. And this is how his work is, is characterized by even um, some close students of his. Um, but what I wanna argue, what I found in reading his work really closely was that he wasn't suggesting a dichotomy. He was suggesting a continuum between risk and uncertainty on, on the one hand. And he, he said, that's because true instances of risk are very difficult to find as are true instances of uncertainty. You know, in instances of uncertainty, we almost always have something in the past that's at least vaguely analogous to the situation we face. And we never really have true conditions of risk where, you know, the, the probabilities that we've assembled, you know, the frequentist probabilities really give us a perfectly accurate view of what's likely to happen next. And instead, these things are, are on a continuum that marked by degrees of uniqueness, which is a phrase that like horrifies grammarians everywhere. Um, you know, how can you have something that is more or less unique? And, and, and Frank Knight is saying, well, there are things that are more or less unique, more or less distinctive, if you will. And so the more instances that we have of something, the closer it is to risk, the fewer instances we have of something having occurred in the past, the closer we are to uncertainty. And then of course, there is the, the sort of um, a condition that, that rarely exists, uh, certainty on, on the one hand. And then there's also this notion of ignorance that, that Knight alludes to, um, doesn't go into in great depth, but definitely alludes to, and that Richard Zeckhauser has pointed out in his uh, work, you have a condition of ignorance where you haven't actually imagined all possible futures. They haven't occurred to you. Um, so what, what do you do in these situations? And what, what Knight said was that there, there are different tools for, for each of these, but the one that he was really focused on was uncertainty. Um, and, and he said, for uncertainty, what's required is judgment. That the formation of those subjective probability estimates, when we don't have quote unquote scientific probabilities, we need to use our judgment. Um, and then I would note that if you're in a condition of ignorance, you need to use imagination. That's not something that Knight really wrote about, but that's what I would say there. If you're in a situation of risk, you can calculate. You can run an expected value calculation. Um, you, can, you can optimize your decision-making. If you're in a condition of certainty, you don't really need to worry about anything anyway. But for uncertainty, you need judgment, which of course um, leads to the, the obvious question, you know, well, Frank, like, how do you get good judgment? How do you get better at making subjective probability estimates? And, and this is, is his answer. And it's like one of the greatest punts in all of like writing, I think, is that he basically dismisses the question um, and, and writes, the ultimate logic or psychology of these deliberations is obscure, a part of the scientifically unfathomable mystery of life and mind. <laughs> Which is, which is to say, he sets up this tremendously important question. He says, actually, most situations, and he was talking mostly about business, but most situations in business are situations marked by uncertainty. And so we need judgment. And then you ask, okay, well, how do we get judgment? And he says, I have it the foggiest. And he never writes about it again in his career. He doesn't really come close to the subject. The closest he comes is when he talks, he writes one article um, in which he refers to management as being an art, not a science. And then he says, because of the sort of unfathomable nature of judgment, strategy is a delusion. Um, 
and coming from you know someone who at the time then was a, a business school professor this is this is not tremendously helpful but this question stuck in my mind as did sort of a a, a similar question which is well if we're operating in ignorance a lot of the time and i think we are we can't imagine all possible outcomes of any given situation how do we develop imagination how do we develop the tool to deal with with that and there i found myself running headlong into this problem that that tom Schelling, you know nobel prize winning economist um stated which is you know there are strong limits to imagination that sort of one thing a person cannot do how rigorous his analysis or heroic his imagination is to draw up a list of things that would never occur to him um so we're, we're left with like two fairly fundamental problems here if we're dealing with uncertainty and ignorance and trying to formulate strategy under either of those conditions one being the limits of our imagination the other one being the unfathomable nature of judgment and so what i tried to do was find someone who had offered an answer and that is how i found myself in the unlikely position of jumping forward um you know 30 or so years after the publication of risk uncertainty and profit to Herman Kahn. Um, and I, I know I don't need to tell many um, people in this audience about the RAND Corporation, but RAND was founded in 1947 um, at the behest of the Air Force. And, and the idea was to keep um, scientists who had been involved in World War II in the national security business, answering some of the most pressing national security questions of the day. But its, it's remit in a way was, was both more specific and more abstract than that, um, which is to say they decided that they wanted to develop a science of war that would substitute rationality for military judgment. And one, one Rand advisor called judgment the disorganized and feebly intuitive shadows of a real analysis. And so this is basically the last place that I would have expected to find an answer to, well, what are the determinants of good judgment? Because the, the people who started off at, at RAND were basically saying, we don't want to deal with judgment. We think it's you know, feeble and intuitive. We want to develop a science of war. And then the reasons for that go to some success that had been had during World War II, a lot of success with the field of operations research, the sort of application of statistical methods to tactical situations. And folks at RAND were like, well, why can't we just take that and like, you know, expand it right and instead of just tactical situations we're going to talk about strategic situations and we're going to apply these same principles to war writ large so it's sort of the last place that i'd expect to find an, an answer to, to judgment and if that's the last place the last guy i would have expected um to to be offering such an answer was was herman khan and so you know that's in part because khan was a a a, a mathematician, a, a physicist who had dropped out of Berkeley's doctoral program. Um, and he specialized in, in Monte Carlo analysis, uh, which is you know, a method for estimating the distribution of, of values for random variables. And he, he wrote um, at, at least one very important paper on Monte Carlo analysis. Um, and, and he, unlike, he's, he's sort of like in personality terms, um, the, the precise opposite of Frank Knight, but he shares this kind of importance and uh, an importance that people don't always, you know, your average person doesn't necessarily recognize. And, and the way he put that was, I'm one of the 10 most famous obscure Americans, which was about, I think, the right, the right description of, of Herman Kahn and his influence. The reason I, I turned to, to Kahn from Knight was as I, as I read Kahn's work, I realized that the more that he worked on sort of quote, you know, you know, calculative measures or methods for determining strategy, as he thought more about Monte Carlo analysis and he was gonna write a big book on it, he became bored um, and he became bored and he became frustrated, you know, bored just because I think that was in part his nature, frustrated because he realized that there was a set of situations that really were not amenable to calculative methods. And, and so he winds up drawing a distinction between what is essentially risk and uncertainty that are uncannily like 
Frank Knight's definitions. So statistical uncertainty here is, is really what Knight would have called risk. And as you can see from, from this quote, it's basically the same definition that, that, that Knight gives. And then he has what's called real uncertainty. And this is where, um, this is the basically equivalent to, to Knightian uncertainty. It's the kind of uncertainty to which one might possibly assign subjective probabilities, but it's impossible to obtain agreement on the numerical values of those probabilities. They are more a matter of taste than of calculation or investigation. And it's, it's eerily like Knight's. And I, I tried um, quite hard to establish a, a direct connection between the two. And I was, I found um, uh, between Knight and Khan that is. And I, I did find one, um, though I can't guarantee it by any stretch that he was the conduit um, for, for this idea moving from, from Knight to Khan. And that is that Andy Marshall, who of course became later famous for running the Office of Net Assessment, was a student of Knight's and then also worked with Khan very closely uh, at, at RAND. Um, but it's, it's not clear that that's how the, the idea of uncertainty was, was transmitted. And frankly, a lot of people at RAND, the more they worked on the issue, um, issues that they were working on, the more that they became fixated on uncertainty as well. Um, for those of you who are trying to parse this picture, um, I believe it is a gentleman in a bathing suit who is also prepared for the rain um, playing three card Monty. Um, why to pick that as like a, a symbol for night and uncertainty, I don't know. And in fact, it actually strikes me as more risk light, but, but nevertheless. Um, so why, why were the, the folks at, at RAND driven from, from especially Khan, driven from, from computation um, to this notion that, well, maybe we actually do need to deal with judgment. Maybe we do need to deal with these subjective probabilities. And, and the answer is like very, very obvious. It's, it's the nuclear revolution. Um, the nuclear revolution, which is perhaps a, a perfect example of uncertainty because it is a situation without historical analog. Never before in the history of humankind have two nations been able to destroy each other as functioning civilizations within a matter of minutes. Um, and Khan talks about it or writes about it rather in Knightian terms. He writes, nuclear war is so far from our experience that it's difficult to reason from or illustrate arguments by analogies from history. So we're dealing with uncertainty. We don't have analogies. On the Knightian continuum, we're like really far toward uncertainty, if not like smack dab in the middle of it. And so he says, as a result, and this is just like Knight would have said, as a result, we need to depend on judgment. Now, the other thing, of course, is that, like, you know, to, to be truthful, we didn't know all the possible outcomes either. So we were dealing with a situation of ignorance as well. And so maybe a need for imagination. And, and Bernard Brody, um, the, the nuclear strategist and, and one time colleague of, of Khan's, um, said, you know what? Human imagination is too weak to envision what nuclear war would be like. And this was like, this is like throwing down the gauntlet in front of someone like Herman Kahn, who's like got this just expansive mind. And, and so his reaction is basically, you know, like, hang on, I have an idea. And he, he has many ideas. And I mean, I throw the, the Dr. Strange little picture up jokingly, but as many of you know, he was actually one of the, the inspirations for the character of, of Dr. Strangelove in uh, Stanley Kubrick's movie. And so Kahn starts churning out like, books, like big books, like, I mean, on thermonuclear wars, you know, this is a big, thick book imagining possible nuclear futures, and, and most of them aren't um, particularly pretty. Um, he's thinking about the unthinkable. Um, he's writing about escalation, metaphors, and scenarios. And, you know, on thermonuclear war, I mean, is, is a, um, not a modestly titled book. Obviously, he's sort of seeing himself as a successor to Clausewitz. Um, in, in the nuclear era. But the, the more important thing here is, well, okay, so he's, he's formulated the question in a Knightian way, saying that we're, we're facing a situation of uncertainty and perhaps of, of ignorance. What do we do? How do we develop the judgment that we need to go forward? 
and he came up with this really interesting idea. Um, and he framed it in, in Knightian terms again. And he said, if the actual past can't provide a guide to uncertainty, then perhaps the imagined future or futures, plural, can. And he, he used this, the, you know, throughout his writing, you find this series of, of phrases about imagined experience, imagined futures, alternatives to the present um, or the past, actually, and the future. Um, he talks a lot about ersatz experience, fake experience. We don't have experience, can we construct it? He talks, obviously, about thinking about the unthinkable. And then he proffers up what he calls some strange aids to thought. Um, because if, if per Brody, the human imagination is, is too weak to really envision what nuclear war might look like, we need, it, we need some help. We need aids to thought. We need aids to imagination. Because the truth of the matter is our past experience just doesn't cut it in this situation. Um, and he, um, in, in a quote that's been attributed to him and to Alan Entoven and to, to some other people, um, when confronted by um, uniformed officers at, at the Pentagon who were frustrated with civilian defense strategists coming up with ideas for nuclear war, you know, his retort was um, uh, reportedly, Colonel, how many thermonuclear wars have you fought? Um, the idea being everybody was in new territory. You could have decades of martial experience. It did not prepare you for the situation we were in, in uh, the 50s or the 60s. There is no one with experience in the conduct of thermonuclear war. So what, what are these strange aids to thought? And so finally, I, I come to um, the, the expertise of, of this organization, I suspect of many in, in the audience. One of those strange aids is the war game. And Khan writes about war games. Initially, he's actually quite critical at RAND of um, social scientists who are, are exploring war games. He sort of you know, finds it a, a soft and fuzzy method of, of non-analysis, but he, he changes his mind. He comes around. And he says there are actually a number of things that we can get out of war games. So or the players can get out of, of war games. And the first is they can kind of, they can pull things out of the realm of ignorance because things can happen in games that you never thought of, that you never expected. So if a player says, it never occurred to me that the response to X could or would be Y. And all of a sudden you've expanded your imagination. You've expanded your sense of what is possible. He said that playing games could improve players' intuitive assessments of a situation, which is another way of saying it could strengthen judgment. It could improve judgment to play war games. And then finally, and this again, this is framed precisely in terms that Frank Knight would have done it. He says, one can learn something about a whole class of situations by amassing enough experiences with specific examples. So what are we talking about here? We're talking about in situations of uncertainty, which are marked by the absence of analogy, what we can do is we can just make them up. We can make them up and that improves judgment. Um, Khan obviously, uh, you know, as I intimated, did not invent war games. Um, and he wasn't the only person at, at RAND doing it either. Um, there was actually a, uh, the sort of the social scientists at, at RAND, which were in opposition both to the, the physicists and the mathematicians, but also the economists who were not considered social scientists. They were sort of at, at an elevated level. But the, the sort of the social scientists were, were getting annoyed of being kept out of the room by those with more quantitative backgrounds. And so they developed war games and, and they resurged um, in, the, in the mid fifties. Um, uh, Herbert Goldhammer, Hans uh, Speer ran political military games. Um, for any of you who are interested in that and wanting to learn more, I would recommend um, Daniel Besner's um, fantastic work on, on that. And these were you know, games where uh, you had two teams engaged in scenario-based conflict. You had the introduction of sort of a, a stochastic element by an umpire who played, you know, quote unquote, nature. And the, the key thing was they weren't intended to solve a problem. 
or optimize an outcome. So contra everybody who's sort of working in the physical sciences or in, in the mathematical realm at RAND, this is not what they were doing. And they were not even necessarily providing science. So it's like social scientists, right? But like, where's the science? And they were like, actually, you know, the problem with war games is they're not replicable. You run one, you're going to get one outcome. You run it again, you're going to likely get another outcome. And so they're offering up this, this, you know, war games, which again, are not new to RAND, but they're offering them up as a method of, of social uh, science inquiry, even though they don't quite meet the definition of, of what a scientific inquiry would, would be. Um, this did not bother Herman Kahn. Um, he's like, well, you know, people complain war games are simplified, they're oversimplified. He's like, that's not a problem. Um, total fealty to reality was not required. The important thing is again, to have enough of an analog so that people feel like they're, like they're not merely partaking in an elaborate conference. They're having an experience. They're, it's Ersatz experience. This game is playing out in their head in a very real way. And, and he said, it's not a problem that the games are not predictive, that the results of any game are not necessarily replicable. And the reason for that is that the future is not predictable, he said. Um, the future is uncertain, which is of course a Knightian concept. Um, and yet, insofar as some parts of the future are more or less determined or even overdetermined, a war game might be successful in exploring these constraints and therefore useful in predictions. And so what you have is that he, he, he sort of offers up war games as improving both judgment and imagination. They can sort of bound uncertainty um, while also reducing ignorance. Um, he did, however, um, and, and this is why he's, I suspect, not more well known for, for wargaming um, it, itself. Um, there were limitations to war games, which is basically like, he's like, they take too long and they take too many people. And, and Khan is this very um, intellectually effusive person. He didn't like write these books. He like dictated them, like to dictaphones that were hanging around his, his neck. And for anyone who's interested in, in the, um, sort of way that Khan operated and worked and thought. Um, I highly recommend uh, uh, Sharon Gamara de Brise's uh, book, The World of Herman Khan, um, which is a fantastic look at him and, and gives you a sense of, of who he is. And so he ends up um, entering into the world of, of scenarios, actually, which is, which is more where I wound up focusing my work. And he, he said, you know, there's, there's no reason that, you know, scenarios, which are usually used as the setup for games, but no reason they can't be considered on their own and that they can't also expand our imagination and put some, some bounds on uncertainty and to substitute for experience. And you start to see that like the role of imagination becomes um, more prominent in his work. And he's like, this is, this is one of the ways we've always dealt with the future. Scenarios are simply a way of disciplining the imagination. So they're another one of these strange aids to thought. And I, I, I love this, this line that, that a scenario is like a one person war game that forces you to ask, what if? And it's, it's interesting because it's not simply about imagining potential futures, but also about developing what you might call strategic empathy, alternative presence, sort of, or what, what research psychologists would call perspective taking. So it's a conscious attempt to try to take account of the enemy's reaction. One simply asks himself, what would the enemy do if I did this? Or what does he think I will do if he does such and such? Um, the, so, so this is like this, I, I don't know, I find this is this fantastically interesting answer. Like we, how do you come up with judgment and, and imagination or judgment, you know, absent analogy? Um, you make up the analogies. <laughs> and so the, the question that I had to ask myself was like, why would that work? Why do we think that's a valid method of inquiry, sort of both for war games and for scenarios? And, and the reason, especially that I had like an enormous number of questions about this is that there are serious problems with a historical analogy 
as a, as a tool for decision making. Um, so I, I mentioned I um, spent way too long at, at a business school um, doing my, my doctorate. And one of the things that I picked up was that in the face of uncertainty, what leaders do is they try to draw analogies to the past. So it's a sense-making device. How do we make sense of this new thing that's in front of us? We, we look to the past. <clears throat> and so Giovanni Gavetti, Daniel Leventhal, and Jen Ripken um, wrote a, wrote a, conducted a study and then wrote a popular piece for Harvard Business Review. And they note, you know, when, complete, when faced with new and complex settings, managers, or you could say leaders, identify the features of the setting that seem most pertinent, think back through their experiences in other settings with similar features, and recall the broad policy that worked well in those settings. And so the, the reason you're drawing analogy is not simply to make sense of the present, but to tell you what you should do now. And it's sort of like, well, if this thing worked well in the past, and that situation was pretty similar, then it should work again now, because the situation is, is pretty similar. But there are a, a couple of like really big problems with that. Um, the, the first one is, is the nature of, of experience. Um, and like not to be too pedantic, but by definition, novel situations lack antecedent. So if you're faced with novelty and you're looking for something that, you know, similar in the past, you're kind of out of luck. But like, even if I relax that, right, and I like take off the, the, the grammar nerd hat that I, that I wear as a former editor, um, the lessons of experience are often ambiguous. Like we think we learn from experience, but how do we know we learn the right thing from experience? Let's say a policy works. How do we know it works because, you know, for the reasons we think it worked or failed for the reasons we think it failed? How do we test that? It's hard. You can't rerun history. Um, so what do you do? How do you determine that? History is highly contingent. Small changes have like, can have dramatic effects on the course of history. And so if you're like really going to draw a, a truly valid analogy, you'd have to account not only for like, does the present look like the past, but do all the potential futures in the past look like the futures we face today? And, you know, that would be a true analogy. It's also not possible. You can't do that. I mean, if we think we have trouble imagining our possible futures today, how do we imagine all the possible futures in the past? Just like not doable. And so we get this like ironic situation where the, the less the world looks like it did, the more we turn to that outdated image for guidance about the future. Um, and that, that sort of, that has, has stuck with me. The, the, the least, the less certain things get, the more we look, you know, to another time that bears no resemblance to it for guidance to the future. Um, the, the second big problem is, is just Every, for those of you who have studied judgment and decision-making or read Daniel Kahneman's work or, or any of the other popular works, analogies trigger basically every bias in the book. And so like, just to give you a, a hint of them, you know, availability bias. We recall things based on vividness. So if we're facing an uncertain situation, um, the analogy that occurs to us first is not necessarily the most representative. It's perhaps the most vivid or the most recent. Um, explanation bias. As soon as we tell ourselves that this thing is like that thing, we come to believe that it is more true, that it is more possible. This is explanation bias. And so what we do is we develop a focal hypothesis, which is a, 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 an assumed to be true frame of reference, which is in essence a prediction, right? As, as Gavetti and Leventhal and Rivkin wrote, you know, we, we think policies that worked in the past will work now. We develop a focal hypothesis about what's gonna work in the future. And then we're just off to the races from a cognitive standpoint. Um, confirmation bias, we have a tendency to, to look for information that confirms hypotheses rather than disconfirms them. We don't ask ourselves, what would it take for me to believe that I'm wrong? And so we become overconfident. And, and this analogy has now become a bit of a millstone, um, whether we know it or not, sort of a cognitive millstone where we're like stuck on this idea and we increasingly come to believe that it's true until we run like smack dab into the fact that it's not. And we think we've identified a, a pattern when in fact we may be facing what neurologists call apophenia, 
And how do you know the difference between pattern recognition and apophenia? So there are all these problems with analogy. So why would we think that developing fake analogy would actually be any better? And the, the reason for that is simply the existence of multiple analogies has been shown to lead to better judgment. Um, and this here I'm drawing on, on psychology research and on um, sort of management research and, and the strategy literature where we find that considering an alternative, simply that level of, of consideration reduces confirmation bias. Um, when you run more specific experiments involving counterfactuals considering alternative pasts and experiments where you, you have subjects consider alternative futures, those, those, those biases that I just went through, the levels of those all drop as well. And so what we find is that generating reference classes, even kind of rough ones, um, even ones that are, that are where the analogies are not perfect because they're never going to be, they improve judgment. And, and the point here, of course, is that war games are a way of generating multiple analogies. Run a game multiple times, we got ourselves a reference class. All of a sudden we're moving out of uncertainty and away from ignorance, frankly, and closer to risk. We'll never get there, of course. We'll never get to perfectly frequent as probabilities about what's gonna happen in a, a specific situation. But we're like, we're moving a bit closer. Um, so let me let me just wrap up there actually, and I'm I'm keen to hear your questions. But the point is essentially uncertainty in both a, a Knightian sense and the way Khan uh, picked it up is marked by the absence of analogy to past experience. And so in those situations, constructing multiple analogies, either by turning to imagination or the, the cultivation of ersatz experience instead of actual past experience actually aids the formulation, actually aids judgment and the formulation of strategy. And war games can create analogies via this ersatz experience. And the, the thing that I find, you know, the, the sort of higher level takeaway here is that imagination, which I think is too often downplayed as a tool, emerges as an invaluable strategic resource in times of uncertainty. Of course, we're always in times of uncertainty, but I think a lot of us have felt it more poignantly um, in the last year plus. And like, you know, you know, why does all this stuff in the past matter today? And I, I come back frequently to these lines from the 9-11 Commission report, um, diagnosing the failure, um, failures that occurred um, on 9-11. And the most important failure was one of imagination. And so it's crucial to find a way of routinizing, even bureaucratizing the existence, uh, the exercise rather, of imagination. And of course, the regular uh, conduct, conduct of war games um, or the formulation of scenarios is one way of, of doing that. And so, you know, to come back just to the original question, how do you formulate strategy under uncertainty? The answer I came to was to use disciplined processes to cultivate imagined futures. So for example, war games or scenarios to improve strategy, to avoid or adapt to surprise and to navigate the uncertainty of the future. So with that, uh, let, me, let me say thank you for your attention um, and I would be happy uh, to take any questions you may have. Great. Well, thank you so much for starters. That was uh, really good. I got some some questions just kind of in the general chat and and privately. Um, so anyone else, anyone else who does have questions, feel free to keep dropping them uh, as they come to you. Um, so we have one question from uh, Vishalji, who is wondering about using the, the, the viability of using redundancy as a sort of um, like pseudo certainty or, or a simulated certainty. Right. So he gives an example of um, like a military application, distinguishing between targeted precision fires versus like a saturation of precision fires? Um, 
I'm not sure I completely understand the, the question. So is redundancy um, a substitute for judgment? Is, is that sort of the idea? Yeah, yeah, I think so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that's, that's, um, that's another, so that's one, one path I would say to, to getting around the problem of judgment. Um, and there are a number of ways of getting around judgment. And one could be, well, if we don't know the precise thing to do, or we don't know that one effort will try, um, then multiple tries um, may in fact do it, or multiple different pathways to the same, um, you know, to multiple potential solutions to the same problem could in fact provide an answer to this question of like, how do I formulate judgment under uncertainty? One doesn't necessarily have to formulate judgment under uncertainty. One can find ways of eliding the question. And I, I would actually put redundancy as maybe a useful way of doing that. Um, and I know we have one more question from Vistology, but I wanted to slip in uh, one that Sebastian just asked. I'm um, just um, asking if you can expand the concept of uncertainty. Um, can that be applied to scenario development in game design? Yeah, I mean, absolutely. So, um, you know, I think one of the questions is how do you how do you create scenarios such that you explore and bound uncertainty? And so for scenario developers who are just doing scenarios, they do that by identifying um, key uncertainties that they think will affect the operational environment in the future. Um, so things that are um, not necessarily uh, issues or actors that we have control over, but forces that are, are broader, that are in the contextual environment, um, who's, that, that, that clearly will impact the, the operational space in the future, but whose values we, we don't know right now. They could, you know, it could be high, it could be low, it could be what have you. Um, and so by, by juxtaposing different key uncertainties, you can kind of bound um, the, the uncertainty space, if, if you will. And then I think games are one way of exploring the dynamics, right? Of, of like, you know, because scenarios are, are static and, and games are dynamic. And then you can use those, you know, different scenarios that are, are come up with um, to explore the dynamics of how the actors um, would would behave in any any given situation of of uncertainty. I hope that I hope that gets at your question um, somewhat. But I, I think they're I think they dovetail essentially. I think the methods dovetail. Great. Um, and I know we just got one question from from Tim Smith, uh, who would, just a quick question. Um, just wondering, have have you put kind of all this in a paper? Is there some sort of consolidated document, or is this kind of over decades of just experience? It's all just in my head. It, there's nowhere else. It's like I'm keeping this locked and key. No. So there, there is a paper. Um, it is not published yet. Uh, I'm trying to turn it into something publishable. Um, and um, one of the ways I'm, I'm trying to improve it is by uh, running it by experts such as yourselves. So I, I welcome any input. I do hope um, to, to put pen. I have put pen to paper, but I hope to put uh, that some, someone else will actually do a print run of the thing at some point. Yeah. And we had uh, one more question from uh, Vishalji. Um, it's a bit technical here, so I'm, um, kind of bear with me, but just wondering if the unknown uncertain, right? If that can't be quantified, does that necessarily make it an unknown uncertainty? So I think that the example he gave was if you know that a weapon system was used and you can say it had an effect, but you can't necessarily quantify that effect. Um, does that still make it necessarily an uncertainty? No. So I would say um, that that just because something is is quantifiable or unquantifiable doesn't make it certain or uncertain. There, you're. I mean, it, so to to get um, nerdy for a second, you're you're talking about different types of uncertainty and sort of um, disaggregating what they would call epistemic uncertainty from aleatory uncertainty. So. Um, epistemic uncertainty can be resolved by the acquisition of more information, whereas aleatory uncertainty sort of involves, you know, the randomness of the future and the, the operation of the world and is, is really you're, you're kind of stuck with it. Um, but, um, you know, the, the knowledge that you're searching for under epistemic uncertainty could be, you know, you know, quant or qual. Um, it could be, could be either or. We just actually got a, a couple more uh, questions in the chat that have popped up. Um, 
One was just, I know you're talking about Khan a bit. Could you explain how he's converted, to, how he was converted to the utility of gaming when, when he was previously a skeptic? You know, I have, I have tried to find the moment, and, and because I, I did focus my work more on scenarios, I've, I've tried to find sort of the aha moment. And, and I will tell you, I have not succeeded in finding like the precise uh, turning point. But I, I will say, um, so there's an, sort of an unpublished biography by one of his collaborators um, titled Super Genius. Um, you can uh, find a PDF online or through a university library. Um, and it just, it talks about the, um, the frustration that he wound up having with Monte Carlo analysis. And he he basically with um, um, a colleague of his had been producing what was supposed to be the definitive book on Monte Carlo analysis. And they do all this work on it and then it just stops. And then you start to see this writing on uncertainty. And then you start to see this, this greater exploration of, of games and scenarios. And ultimately Khan leaves Rand and um, you know, in, in part because he wants to explore these things in his way. And he, he co-founds the Hudson Institute, um, uh, which is um, again, focuses more on scenarios ultimately than on, on games. And I, you know, here I'm I'm speculating, so I'll you know do with it what you will. But in part, I think that that Khan became drawn more to scenarios than to games because he could be a one man war game. Um, his you know he could he could sort of like riff and riff and riff and riff and just sort of you know do all of this without the logistics of having to get a bunch of people together in a room and actually actually deal with them. He could construct scenarios you know out of whole cloth himself, um, and and you know I think that probably held some allure. Uh, for him and just just on the point of of con um it's just a question in, in the wargaming community there's currently a growing debate about whether wargaming is a science or an art um you know whether data or the experiences is the keystone of wargaming so just in, in your opinion where do you think con sits on that side of the debate on, on that side of the debate i would say he, he considers it more art than science but i mean to some extent it's craft um, you know, the, it's, it's somewhere in the middle, which may not be, you know, a completely satisfactory answer. It's like, I mean, cause what is, what is craft exactly? Um, it, it, it involves, it involves both, but, um, it's, it's scientific, I would say in the sense that it's, it's construction and it's application are rigorous. It's a rigorous method, but it doesn't produce replicable results. And therefore, the the scientific community will 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 balk um, if it can't it's, if it's not predictive, right? If you run a game, it doesn't necessarily predict what's going to happen. There aren't like you know you know it's not necessarily uncovering laws of human behavior or human nature, and therefore it doesn't sort of fall into the social science category. But you know, the, I would say that the difference between that and and say, um, you know art, you know, you know, poetry that envisions the future is there is a, you know, the, the methodology is more rigorous. And, and that, you know, both in that and, and in, you know, good, I mean, and we're talking about good war gaming and good scenario construction, that lends it um, uh, greater, gosh, I want to say epistemic value, and that just sounds pompous, but that's, that's how I see it. Yeah. We actually just in the last few minutes, I've had a couple questions on um, how the concept of uncertainty uh, could apply to current efforts in whether it's wargaming as a field or more specifically with wargaming uh, technologies. Um, I don't know that I can speak to technologies, um, um, but I think that, you know, I think that to the degree that we perceive increasing uncertainty, there is an opportunity to use games to explore uncertainty in a more concerted way than has been done. And it's not to say that there aren't lots of efforts to use gaming because there are, just as there are lots of efforts to use scenarios. But like, is there a, a you know, a, a concerted effort to do so to really bound some of the, the most serious questions that we have, um, you know, that is, that is rigorous, that is accepted at a high level. I mean, if you're talking about the U.S. government, you have like various entities that are wargaming and maybe doing some scenario planning and, and what have you. But like, how does that aggregate into a more bounded, defined picture of the uncertainties that we face? It just strikes me that there's enormous opportunity and need and demand at a moment like this. Um, but the right person has to be asking for it. The right person has to be asking the question.
And just on that note of, of um, the extent to which the government kind of is involved in war gaming, on that last slide when you were talking about, mentioned the 9-11 Commission and um, imagination, have you found in your experience that there's a more or maybe less effective way in kind of, I don't know if this is the right term, but kind of spurring imagination? Um, so there's, I mean, there's spurring imagination and they're spurring the, the exercise of imagination through these, through these um, methods. So I think the methods spur imagination. I think forcing you to, you know, if you're doing scenario construction to sit down and, and juxtapose, you know, like come up with a list of key uncertainties and juxtapose those, come up with a scenario, then, you know, let's say run through that scenario in a dynamic sense that, you know, would, would constitute a game in which there are, are players, you know, pitted against each other with, you know, differing, different goals. Um, that generates, that's, that sparks imagination that like, I don't know, draws forth the, the fruits of imagination. From an institutional standpoint, um, what I will say is that what I have found, um, and it, it's not, I don't want to say that it's dispositive, but it requires leadership from the top or interest at the top. Um, it requires, because if it, if it comes from below, if the sort of impetus comes from below, it can work, but often um, one runs a smack into the question. And I, I'd be curious actually as to whether people who are listening or, or you or Sebastian have run into this problem where people start asking, well, what's the return on investment? How do I know, like, what exactly am I getting out of this? And, and can you quantify it? Like, I mean, if you're doing this for a business, it's like, okay, so we're gonna sink X thousand dollars or hundreds of thousands of dollars into a game. How can you prove to me that it's going to improve judgment and strategy such that, you know, my, my return on investment is, is positive? It's a very difficult thing to prove. It's a very difficult thing. It's, I mean, it is like, a, it's an epistemological problem to demonstrate sort of the value of these things. And so to some extent, having simply a leader, someone at the top who's like, this is a good idea to consider various ways that the future might pan out. I mean, this is not like a hard sell for me, right? Like for me, I'm like, yes, we should be thinking more about how the future might turn out. We should be thinking more about unintended consequences or unimagined consequences or like dynamics that we haven't explored. This like, to me, is, is self-evident. To me, asking sort of about ROI is the wrong question, but it's not for a lot of people. And so having um, someone who is, is convinced of the value of exploring the future up front uh, is, is extremely useful. Yeah, no, and I, I think it's it's a valid viewpoint. I, I feel like more people would be on board with it just given the pandemic and how, I, I'm just trying to think that that sort of imaginative thinking, right? So like viewing epidemiolog epidemiological risk um, wasn't really inputted into, I don't wanna say most, but a lot of just the way that companies and maybe even governments operated. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it wasn't at the same time, there were all these exercises run on the possibility of pandemics, right? That were either, I mean, whether they were war games or tabletop exercises or simulations, or, you know, we can debate like the like different meanings of those things, but, um, or, or scenarios, for example, like, like people were thinking about this in advance. And so this, I mean, this frankly raises another point, which is you can institutionalize imagination, but then does it have an input into the policymaking process? And if it doesn't, you can run war games until you know you're you're blue in the face, and um, you you may not actually have any any effect. Um, but I think there is a resurgence in interest around these methods. Um, I think that's I think that is true. Um, okay, and then we've got two more questions looping back on Khan, very popular guy in the chat. Uh, and then I think currently that's it. So if you have any last questions, please do feel free to, to toss them in the chat. Um, one was just asking, did Frank Knight's dislike of quantitative methods uh, pass on to Khan through like uh, through transmission and just from teaching him? Um, it, it, it didn't. And, and there was no, as I said, there was, it's, it's really hard to draw a direct line between Knight and Khan. The way I sort of see it is like Knight tees up the problem and very much disaggregates the nature of risk and uncertainty and, and ignorance. And, and Khan is the guy that like picks it up and answers it. Um, but drawing a link between the two of them is, is actually extraordinarily difficult to my great um, disappointment. And Knight's own feelings about quantification um, were like, like I threw up with that first that that first quote of his, you know, everything is both true and false at the same time. He he believed in um, 
in, in quantification, thought economics was a precise science, and at the same time thought that it didn't describe reality, it didn't describe economic behavior um, as, as, um, as precisely as it should. And he got, he, he became quite upset with what he saw as the trend of the field toward, you know, not what he would say is science, but really scientism, trying to impose, impose sort of a, a false degree of quantifiability on the phenomena that he was interested in. And so actually, at the end of the day, he ends up kind of breaking with the Chicago School of Thought that he had helped found. Um, it's, a, it's a fascinating story I could talk about night ad infinitum, but I, I you know, I don't want to make it ad nauseum for you. So, uh, and then, then just on that con point, um, could you expand a bit on Khan's uh, work on scenarios and how he used them? Um, so, um, Khan did, did a variety of things. He he first, you know, he started off with envisioning what different world wars could look like. I think on thermonuclear war has something like the next eight world wars. There's a is a chapter in it, and so just. Um, sort of, you know, thinking the unthinkable where people were saying like, you know, Bernard Brody was saying like a nuclear war cannot be won and therefore must never be fought. Like there is, you know, war maybe used to be an extension of politics by other means. It is no longer a, an extension of politics by other means because suicide is not a rational end. Um, Khan was like, well, you know, you know, we, we, you know, we would lose a lot of people, but let's think about what the United States would look like, you know, minus X million people with X percentage of its industry destroyed. And he'd sort of riff on that. And so it wasn't the kind of, you know, more rigorous scenario construction that we'd um, talk about today or that, that real scenario planners would talk about today. When he went to the Hudson Institute though, he did try to formalize the method a, a bit more um, and actually tried to add um, a quantity measures to it and sort of say, well, are certain scenarios more or less probable um, than others, um, which is something that scenario planners tend to avoid actually. Um, and the, but it was via him that the method wound up making its way to business um, when Pierre Vac and some of his colleagues, Ted Newland, attended one of Khan's seminars at the Hudson Institute on scenarios. And, and these were two executives from Royal Dutch Shell and, and they were like, wait, this, we can do something with this. We can change people's minds with this. We can change their mental models of how things work. Um, and this is sort of one way that, that you know, imaginative exercises like war games and scenarios work is they, they change the way people think. They change their mental models of kind of cause and effect relationships in the world. And, and they took it back to Royal Dutch Shell with them. And you know, scenario planning has been a, an institutionalized part of, of that company for the last you know, 50 years. Then um, moving ahead, how do you think wargaming can, can improve? That's kind of a broad, mm. nebulous question. That is, I mean, it's a fantastic question and it's not one that I feel qualified to answer. I, I, I am sorry. Like, and, and this is because I come at it, you know, from the, you know, when you come at wargaming from the vantage point of Frank Knight, you don't necessarily, um, you know, are, are not up on the state of the art on, on wargaming. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to not try to answer that and not sound very good. Um, instead, I'm going to leave that. I'm going to leave that one there. Hopefully, there's at least one more question, Grant, so that I don't have to. Be <laughs> there, so, I suppose then, on on the flip side, looking back, um, is there a certain war game that uh, you wish had been designed, and and why? A certain war game I wish had been designed. I mean, I will say that the, you know, and again, game exercise simulation. I don't know. The first thing I thought myself thinking of when the pandemic struck was Dark Winter 2001, um, which again was run even before 9 11, before the anthrax attacks. And it just impressed upon me with such clarity the degree to which um, these methods can be used to explore the limits of our imagination and, and put some boundaries around uncertainty. Um, but that if taken as valuable inputs um, can, can really demonstrate to us the, the things that we might find ourselves facing in, in, the, in the future and possibly not even the not too distant future. And then we actually kind of on a, on a lighter note, um, just had a question, do you think uh, Kubrick, Kubrick would be a war gamer? <laughs> I, I think so. I think it's a, um, 
a, a natural medium for people who like exploring the human condition and the, the sort of strange things that can come out of human dynamics. Um, when, when people interact with each other, you, some, you get results that you don't necessarily expect to see. And so it's, it's like, a, I, th I think it's a sort of a dream um, for people who are interested in that. Okay, on that note, I think that's all the questions we have. Um, for anyone that, whose question I missed, please do ping me right now. I can uh, vamp for a bit. Um, but uh, this whole video should be on uh, Georgetown University Warning Society YouTube channel. Um, it's usually uploaded within about a day or so. Um, so if anyone had to hop off early or, or wants to kind of go through some of the slides again, uh, the slides get posted as well to the um, Georgetown University Wargaming slide deck. Um, Dr. Skoblik, thank you. This was great. We had, I don't know if you managed to uh, take a peek at the chat, but a pretty lively back and forth discussion um, kind of throughout the presentation. So huge thank you to you. Um, and a huge thank you to, to everyone who was here on the webinar too. Great, thank you so much for having me. I really enjoyed it.